January is National Hot Tea Month, and no, we are not talking about spilling the tea. We're talking about actual tea, and here to walk us through the history of the tea, we have celebrity historian Rafi Andonian. Rafi, thank you so much for joining me. Of course, great to be here and do as Nirvana says. You know Nirvana, right? Oh, Rafi. Sit and drink Penny Royal tea. There we go. Okay, now I have to go do my Nirvana <laughs> I didn't know he was doing that, but we're going to sit yeah, and drink some about tea today, tea. too. That's right. I like it. Let's talk about, you know, the history of tea and, and where it kind of comes from. Well, originally, for centuries upon centuries, millennia was used in China for many reasons, including medicinal purposes. But the English don't start, which is what we think of, right? Mm -hmm. English tea. Mm -hmm. Drinking tea. They don't start drinking tea until later, really recently, historically speaking, mm -hmm. if you're looking across thousands of years. Until about the 16th century, or maybe 17th century is when they started to do that. They have a company known as the East India Tea Company, right? Okay, we know about <laughs> so, that when it comes to like the Boston Tea that's Party, right? right? Well, the Boston Tea Party is much later, and we'll, oh come, to, we'll come to that for okay. the U.S. <laughs> but the English, when they're colonizing the world, and they're also looking for spices in the spice trade in the Far East, part of what they bring in is tea, and it becomes all the rage. Now, later on, when they colonize over to the Caribbean, mm -hmm. they start to grow a lot of sugar as well, and that plays into the story as well. But what's important to know is that when it becomes an English thing is by the looking for the Eastern trade, for the spices that we all know about, that's when it becomes an English thing. Never grows in, the Eng in England, still doesn't. It's just, cultivated, it's just cultivated elsewhere and imported there, and it kind of has their brand on it. Okay, well, there you go. English tea. And let's talk a little bit about sugar. I mean, you mentioned the Caribbean. In. I know kind of a dark time in history, yeah. but that's really where it came from, us yeah. putting the sugar in the tea. That's right. So think about now, we're talking about a luxury item with the mm -hmm. tea, right? Because when they're doing the importing and exporting, it is a luxury item. Well, what's another luxury item during the colonial period? Sugar. Wow. Because sugar, if you, if you go to some old homes sometimes, historic homes, what you'll see is there's a spice cabinet that's locked. Well, the, the person in the house that was running the kitchen would have a key to the lock and inside the, the lock often is another lock for particularly the sugar because it was known as white gold. And precisely as you point out in the Caribbean, that's where most slaves that are coming across the Atlantic are being sent because it's the most profitable place because sugar is so profitable. So it does also have a dark history, but because it's also a luxury item, think of how they're considering this as luxury item tea and luxury item sugar, which is expensive, putting it in, makes it a decadent luxury treat. And that's how you end up adding sugar to tea. Now over time, when sugar becomes cheaper, it becomes more accessible to the working classes and tea becomes more popular. I like that. What about tea in the United States? I mean, we go, we go from China to England to the Caribbean, but how did it get to the States? Well, because of the colonization and, of course, the, col the colonials on the East Coast, at least, are seeing themselves as English, they're going to drink a lot of tea. But there's a coffee revolution that takes place <laughs> yes, around the is. same place. <laughs> so you mentioned the Boston Tea Party earlier. That's a big part. That's in the 1770s. Now, you know, we're English for, for 150, 200 years, but now in the 1770s when we're trying to break from the English and dumping the tea <laughs> into the sea, it really begins to shift tastes in the United States. Now, coffee houses were a thing. Coffee houses did exist in what is now the U.S. and Virginia and New York, uh, certainly in London during the Enlightenment, and there were places to exchange ideas overly democratic in the, crown, in the eyes of the English crown. There was concern that there was false news being spread there. We've heard that term today. We have. Because there's too many people going there and exchanging rumors. Often newspaper reporters were there. And so but that coffee house democracy is also where a lot of the American Revolution ideas begin to take off. The, the protests to the Stamp Act that we all hear about are beginning the coffee house and are read from the coffee house. So that coffee house also becomes a symbol of rebellion. So when you think about dump the tea into the sea, that's the context that's coming in, and that's how it becomes more American to drink coffee. And that's why while tea is more popular around the world, in the United States, coffee is more popular. That makes so much sense. I mean, Robbie, <laughs> you're breaking it down. I mean, and this is something you won't necessarily learn in your history class. I mean, we know we learned about the yeah. Boston Tea yeah. Party and the American yeah. Revolution, but knowing that coffee was really kind of the the, the English didn't the, like it for that reason. Tea oh had this hierarchy, gosh. but coffee doesn't have it. It's true also in Germany. They don't like that it's taking away from uh, beer. In the Ottoman Empire, there's problems because coffee huh. is too democratic, and they see it as, as eroding hierarchy. This kind of becomes a thing around the world, but the Enlightenment loved it. Oxford University had a lot of coffee houses or around in that Oxford, England, um, that would um, uh, be called known as penny universities because you could go for cheap and exchange ideas, and it's not as bad as a tavern because a tavern is where you get drunk, and a coffee house is way 
have a fancy philosophical conversation. So yeah, the idea is like coming that. out, and that's why U.S. seizes on it as a symbol of democratic rebellion. Throw the tea out, bring the coffee in, and cheers to American coffee. Cheers <laughs> to American coffee. I like it. Well, I personally, it's hard for me. I'm like, do I want tea? Do I want coffee? I actually had both today, so I'm kind of wired up. What'd you bring in for us to enjoy, Rafi? Well, I got all kinds of coffee. Now, for the tea, we have some French tea here. You can see okay. it's French on there because I'm fancy like that. I like now, that. I, I like actually it. got that in Virginia, believe it or not, <laughs> from someone who's a flight attendant who imports them from all over the world and runs a little shop. Ooh, so I end up getting cool. random little teas like that. Yeah, really, oh I know. My How gosh, smooth that is that? How smooth does that smell? Incredible. That's right. And this here is from California. Mm -hmm. You can see just really fancy different flavors. It's loose leaf, just like the one that you saw here. There, you can see in there. There's a loose leaf in there. Okay. So just you know, really purest type of uh, stuff. Or again, randomly, I get them at little stop shops and stores as I shop around. Tea represents you know a lot of the taste of the world as it's spread around. I like that. Well, cheers to that, and cheers to National Hot Tea Month. But don't go anywhere, St. Louis. We'll be right back.